Welcome to the Symposium podcast of the Geops Lustrum. I am Frederik Prins from the Symposium Committee and this is Rewired. Today our guest will be Hugh Broughton from Hugh Broughton Architects. We will be talking about polar architecture with focus on the first architectural design on the South Pole, Halley 6. This will be our last podcast in the Symposium Week series. We are very happy and grateful to have been able to organize this event. At the end of the interview, there was some time for some other members of the committee to ask some interesting questions. So, uh, welcome. Um, I'm talking today uh, with Mr. Hugh Broughton from uh, Hugh Broughton Architects in London. Um, so we're very happy that you could join our podcast today. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we're talking to you today about some uh, projects you did on uh, Antarctica. Um, but before we, st- uh, we just jump, jump into that, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself first and what you do and uh, what your main uh, area of focus is. Sure. Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Hugh Broughton. Um, I'm an architect and I work in uh, West London in uh, England and uh, we're in office of around kind of 18 people at the moment and uh, our practice was set up uh, quite a long time ago now back in kind of like 1995 um, and we started off kind of focusing on, you know, like lots of architectural practices, small residential projects. And then in around um, 2005, our whole practice changed fundamentally uh, because we won a big competition to design one of these uh, stations in Antarctica. But not despite that, even though we have you know, entered into this new uh, area designing buildings for the polar regions, um, we have continued working on buildings in kind of historic and sensitive locations. Um, So alongside those polar research stations, we've worked on museums and uh, other cultural buildings and historic renovations and that kind of thing. So it's quite a kind of unusual mix of projects, I think. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Okay, so uh, also the the project you want uh, to to work on in 2005, that was, I believe, uh, your most famous uh, project on the Antarctica also, I think. So that's the Haley 6 um, base, and that was opened in 2013. And then after that, you also worked on the Juan Carlos um, base, which is visible behind you now. And then um, you're n- now working on the Scott base uh, redevelopment, I think, and a new building at the Rodera base. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so um, sh- should I tell you about why, how we got involved to start with? Yeah, yeah, of the Haley 6 project then. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's nice, we start with that. So, yeah, that was back in, um, it, the, the competition for that project was launched back in 2004, and it was quite an unusual situation, I guess, because uh, the British Antarctic Survey ha- have four uh, research stations in Antarctica, and in the past they had always been built by the army or designed by engineers, very, very practical kind of buildings. Um, But they decided that they wanted something more than that. They wanted, you know, maybe the kind of building that an architect could offer that would be built more around the requirements of the people than uh, specifically and only the demands of the environment. So they decided to hold an architectural competition. And the amazing thing was, of course, at that point, very few architects had been involved in any projects in Antarctica. I think there was one firm uh, who had worked on the US base at the South Pole, but otherwise nobody had designed one of these research stations. So it was a it was a kind of unique moment, really, where, you know, a small practice of architects could compete against some of the biggest names in the world and nobody could put forward an example of a project they'd done before. Everybody was 
you know, at the same start point, which is really unusual in architecture. Normally, you know, you find there's always somebody or a group of other people who've designed a much bigger airport and busier railway station, a, you know, um, a more elaborate art gallery, whatever it is. But in this case, there was nobody who could do that. So I found myself one morning listening to the national radio here in the UK, and they were talking about the launch of this competition. But they did set down the requirements of the architects they were looking for. They had to be really experienced in sustainability. They had to have worked in foreign countries a lot. They had to be experts in prefabrication. Ideally, they would be from a multidisciplinary practice. And um, they also had worked on lots of remote projects. And I remember listening to all five categories and thinking, we can't do any of those. All we have done is refurbishments of people's apartments. And the biggest building we had designed at that point was a 200 square meter building for um, the Girl Guides uh, in West London. But I thought, well, I'll still go along to the launch of the competition. And I met an engineer there and he said to me, oh, can I team up with you? And I said, well, you know, we're such a small office, only four people at that time. Um, it might be better if um, we teamed up with you. And so he went back and saw his boss and his boss said, oh, well, let's find out a bit more. And they actually found two engineers based in Colorado in the US who had worked on the US polar program for many years. And they flew over to the UK and they helped us to get our initial ideas together to be sort of realistic for the Antarctic environment. And so uh, we made it into the final uh, three practices being considered for the project. And then I guess it just came down to who came up with the, the idea that you know, was best suited for what the British Antarctic Survey were looking for. So the competition actually lasted for about eight or nine months. And then fin finally we won. So it was a really, it was a, I think it was one of those very, for me, it was a really unique moment. It was when um, the client kind of wanted a big engineering company, but an architect who would challenge them with new ideas. Um, the, uh, nobody else had done one of these buildings. And I think there was a kind of mood of let's try something different. So let's try a practice that no one's heard of. So it was kind of, I think these things happen only once or twice in your life. So we were really lucky. That was our lucky moment, put it that way. Yeah, that's really amazing. It's yeah. also very, and then, very and inspiring, I think, for us upcoming architects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, yeah. And it was really interesting, you know, when, when we won, I think some people were like, who are they and how have they ever managed to win? And I think, uh, you know, there was an amazing, amazing courage in a way shown by uh, the client that they didn't feel that they had to choose a famous name. They wanted a really good idea, not a famous, na <clears throat> famous name. And as you say, it should be pretty encouraging to anybody um, that, you know, these it is possible to win these amazing competitions just just by thinking hard about what the client wants and um, giving them a bit more than they expected. And that's what we did. When we had the interviews, though, there were some quite fun things. When was the reason they said that we won is we had a really good idea about the sort of construction and how the building could be moved. And we'll talk about that a bit more, I guess, in a minute. Um, but they were also really interested in our ideas about the interiors. And not that many people put that much thought into the interiors. But for example, we had an architect who worked here at the time and she really enjoyed sewing. So she made four different cushions out of different fabric and in different colors. And um, uh, they were just sort of like her, her thinking about, oh, well, what will the material be on the armchairs and the sofas and what will it feel like? And so we took these along to the interview and we said, oh, here you go. Here are the cushions we're thinking of putting on the sofa. And they were like, wow, you know, we thought we were going to be talking about the big ideas of how we move the building, but you're already thinking about the cushions we're going to sit on. And they really liked they really liked that as well. It was very kind of uh, personal. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a very, it wasn't in any way a kind of corporate response. And they really liked that, I think. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so indeed, uh, let's talk uh, about the interior. Um, also, but a little bit later, I thought we could first uh, talk about what's so special about this Haley station, because it's like uh, it's the sixth station um, of the Haley series, sort of, um, which is uh, because of the location, which I, I found very, very interesting. Um, so it's located at the, the Brunt Ice Shelf, I think, 
yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit more land uh, land inwards. Is that the English word? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> more inward to the uh, to the to the south thing. Yes. And it's uh, located on this ice layer, which is constantly moving towards the sea. Yes. Which is why the previous five uh, Haley's all sort of met their demise. Yes. Um, and so this station. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you uh, if you could tell us a little bit how it works, but I thought that it might be interesting if you could relate that a little bit to the history of all these previous Haley uh, stations and they didn't work and why this one does. Sure, yeah. So um, the, the station is located on what's called, as you've described, a floating ice shelf. So this is where the ice, so ice moves a bit like water. Um, just at a slightly, obviously, slower speed, but it still flows in the same way as water. And that's why you get glacial valleys and things like that, where the ice is flowing through the valley and scarring the sides and so on. And so this ice has flowed off the main plateau of Antarctica and it's flowed, uh, flowed off the landmass and onto the sea. And it's basically floating on the sea, but it's very thick. It's 150 meters thick. And so the first um, Halley station was built on this floating ice shelf. And the reason it was built there um, is a sort of number of reasons, I guess. There are scientific reasons um, and it's a really good location at, a, at around um, 70, I think it's 74 degrees south. And which means that it's in the optimum location for studying interaction of the sun with the Earth's atmosphere. And in particular for observing things like uh, the southern lights or the aurora australis um, and there's some been amazing science that has come out of Halley over the years it was for example the first place where scientists first observed the hole in the ozone layer so uh, one of the most important sort of i guess pieces of environmental research leading to one of the greatest pieces of environmental legislation which was the montreal protocol banning the use of uh, carbon fluorocarbon so you know significant um, discoveries made there. So it's really good for science. The other thing is that because it's on a floating ice shelf, it's close to the sea, so it's easier to bring a ship there to resupply it with food and fuel and uh, people and that kind of thing. So that's good. And then I guess the third main reason why the station is in that location is that uh, originally there were a series of territorial claims to Antarctica and a number of different nations had claims to the Antarctic continent and the British claim, which is kind of like, you know, shaped like a wedge uh, or a slice of cake. Um, they have their stations at the two extremes of the, the wedge that they claim. One is at Rothera Station and the other is at Halley and they, they kind of demark the, the, the wedge of claim. Um, of course, with the um, onset of the Antarctic Treaty, everybody renounced their claims to the territory, although they're still recorded. So I guess there are there are sort of three reasons why um, a station was first established there. Well, it, it, when it was established, it was part of a trans-Antarctic expedition. Um, so uh, the British explorer, Sir Vivian Fuchs, he was going to drive in tractors from Halley Station to the South Pole. And the New Zealand explorer, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, he was going to lay food bases from the other side of the continent at what's now Scott Base, and he was going to lay food supplies. So when Sir Vivian Fuchs got to the South Pole, he could carry on and there would be food for him. Um, so it, it was also sort of located in that location as a start point for this big expedition. Um, and the first, so the first station that was built there was very basic. It was like a timber hut with a pitched roof and um, probably pretty cold inside. And what happens at Halley is that, that when it snows, the snow never melts because the temperature never rises above freezing. So every year the snow level rises by about one to one and a half meters. So after about four years, uh, the snow had risen right up to the ridge line of the roof. So the whole building was buried. So they carried on living in it for another few years, but they had to build sort of like timber uh, shafts with ladders inside to climb down into the building which was buried under the snow and then eventually the movement of all the ice crunched the building and uh, they had to abandon it so then the next building they designed um, was similar and they had to abandon that quite quickly as well 
And then the third building, they thought, hold on a minute, all these buildings keep getting buried by the ice and crushed by it. Let's design a building specifically to get buried. So they made these big metal tubes and then they put the accommodation in the tubes and then slowly the snow level rose and the building got buried. But even though it was in these metal tubes, um, it still got crunched by the ice and eventually they had to abend abandon that. So then the fourth version, uh, they built yet another tube system, a bit more sophisticated, two interconnected tubes, and they put everything inside and it was a bit better. But I think you have to imagine what it would be like to live inside a tube under the ice in Antarctica. Yeah, it's really cold. It's also really, really smelly because you smell all the sewage, you smell all the diesel fumes from the generators. Uh, you can't get away from anybody. There's no view. It's a pretty horrible existence. So eventually that building also was destroyed. So the fifth version, they kind of learned their lesson and thought, hold on a minute, we don't want the building to get buried, but we don't want to live under the ice. So they built the building as a platform elevated above the ice on legs uh, with all the accommodation on the platform, a bit like an oil rig. And then the wind could blow underneath the building and blow the snow away so it didn't get buried and they hadn't had a view out. Um, but the legs that, of that building were stuck in the ice and the ice shelf is constantly flowing out to sea. So Halley 5 was moving more and more out to sea. And in around 2002, uh, some scientists at the British Antarctic Survey noticed that there were cracks appearing in the ice shelf and that there was a likely situation where a huge chunk of ice of the ice shelf would break off as a giant iceberg and that Halley 5 would be on the wrong side of the crack and would disappear out on the iceberg. So it was at that point they then decided, oh, we're going to need Halley 6. So that's when they launched the competition uh, for uh, Halley 6. So in, I guess in that story, you can see what big challenges are of designing in the Antarctic. So you have rising snow levels. Uh, you have very high uh, wind speeds blowing snow and ice. It's obviously very cold. It uh, never rises above freezing in summer, but in winter it can go down to about minus 55 degrees Celsius. Um, uh, it's dark for three months of the year. The sun doesn't rise above the horizon for 105 days. Uh, it's very isolated. Uh, the ship only comes uh, once in December and again in February, and that's it. Um, so there are a lot of challenges to designing in, in this location, which were things then we had to address in our uh, solution. Yeah. And so... Uh, That's the short answer. <laughs> wow. No, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so the Haley 6 uh, is also on the files, but it doesn't float away, or does it? That's right, yeah. So um, it's made, uh, Haley 6 is made up of a series of modules all uh, that are in and uh, each of the modules is supported where there are blue modules and there's one bigger module which is red and the blue modules have four legs and the red module has six legs and uh, each of the legs has got giant skis on the bottom so that when there is the risk that the ice shelf might carve off again as an iceberg um, the modules can be disconnected from each other. They have hydraulic legs, which means they can uh, concertina inside each other themselves. And so the module can lower down and then they can pull the modules uh, to a new location using a bulldozer. So, uh, yeah, so they have big skis and hydraulic legs and those are a key part of the of the design. And it means that um, Halley 6 won't disappear on an iceberg like the other other ones. Um, yeah. might have done. And yeah. they have actually done this relocation. So when we originally built the station, we built it at the site of Halley 5 um, till about it was like, I don't know, 60 or 70 percent complete. And then the modules were dragged to the new location of Halley 6. So it proved this uh, idea of pulling them on the skis. And then since then, there have been some cracks appeared in the ice shelf. So they had to move it again. And uh, it was also very successful that move too. Yeah. And I, I imagine you also had to change the materials then of the compared to the previous um, Haley's. 
Yeah, so the last, the Halley 5 was made of, um, mostly of timber. So it has a kind of plywood outer skin, um, then uh, some timber structure inside with insulation and then plywood and so on on the inside. And it was quite successful, but wherever you get the structure timber, the heat was escaping out. So it wasn't so efficient. So um, uh, we also had to be very conscious when we were designing Halley 6 that because the modules would have to be moved, that the outside of the building would have to be very strong, uh, able to resist one leg losing support underneath it if it hit some soft snow and that kind of thing. So uh, in the end, we opted to use glass fibre panels, um, which so you get uh, the glass fibre sandwiches insulation. Um, but so there's two skins of glass fibre with insulation in the middle and this glass fibre is really, really strong. Um, and then that is fixed to a steel frame. So uh, yeah, the buildings are much stronger than they were before, which is good for resisting the wind, but also good for the stresses that come from moving the buildings. Yeah, OK. And uh, you work together with this with the two engineers uh, where they they were from uh, Acom. Yes, that's right. Yeah. To, um, well, the two particular engineers, Michael Wright and Peter Ayres, um, that um, who who were sort of the lead structural engineers, I guess, for the project. So yeah, and we had to work really closely, and it was a really interesting process because everybody just became so passionate about the whole project and uh, so interested in every aspect. And because everything is so interconnected, you know, it's not like you can do the architecture and leave the engineering to somebody else. You have to understand the engineering to do the architecture and vice versa. So, you know, as an example, uh, Michael Wright, who was the structural engineer, he just became one of his big obsessions wasn't to do with structure or skis. It was actually to do with corridor widths. He was he was obsessed with getting the right corridor width for people to be able to walk past each other. And, you know, we, we became equally obsessed about the design of the connection between the leg and the ski. You know, you just you just it was a very holistic kind of design process, I guess, which is kind of really nice. Yeah. So who came up with the with the leg idea of it that it, you can move it on skis? Well, we we always had the idea. I don't know where that original idea um came came from um, the the idea of elevating the buildings up was pretty natural because we wanted the air to flow underneath to stop the snow drifting um, and I think what happened is that um, when these two Americans came over from uh, Colorado they showed us a building which had been built by the US at the South Pole which was a small module and it was on a it was on a kind of elevated frame and then it had like railway sleepers underneath and they attached that to a bulldozer and they dragged it to a different location and uh, it was quite cool and we looked at it and we went well, why did you put it on railway sleepers and they went oh because it's good for sliding it and we said well you I guess you could do the same with just like big skis and they went that would be a good idea so I <laughs> guess it was sort of like that's how it kind of came about yeah it's funny that you should uh, say that that is kind of a natural idea that you you wanted to uh, the, the snow to be able to go underneath and wind because we also talked about uh, this with um, Mr. Salmon from Salmon and Partners in Belgium. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and he also made a building in Antarctica with a, uh, a bit, yeah the the, ba the station the being Princess on, Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one. And yeah, he yeah. said that it's actually pretty stupid to not build it on the legs. And he doesn't. He, he, he was like, why don't the don't all of the building uh, all of the uh, people design it that way on the uh, Antarctic? I know, um, I know. But I think the thing is that um, uh, I, I agree. It makes it makes obvious common sense now because we all have much more experience about how how things work. But I guess on the other hand, you can understand why. The first buildings, um, you know, like Captain Scott's hut or uh, Roald Amundsen's hut or all these original buildings were, were just like timber huts that they bought from Britain or Norway or wherever. Um, and then they saw them getting buried. And you can imagine that kind of light bulb moment. And they thought, oh, it gets buried. Let's design it to get buried. And so they go down before they realize how unpleasant it is. And then they go they go up. So I agree with uh, Philippe that it is obvious now, but you can also understand why in the past they didn't. They they just made at the moment that they were deciding, oh, the building got buried. 
they made the they just went oh let's let's design it to get buried rather than oh let's design it to let the wind underneath they just made the it was like they were at a crossroads and they turned the wrong direction temporarily do you know what i mean yeah yeah uh, but the other regarding your other projects on the antarctica uh because you didn't implement this lag id in the same way in all of these other projects like in the juan carlos and the uh, scott base i think you see, see it most uh see still see these legs coming and uh back into the uh, your designs mm. and the aerodynamic designs uh, mm. but, um i saw that less in the the design of the new rothera building yeah so the the rothera building doesn't isn't elevated on legs so it it sits on the ground and the reason that it sits on the ground is that at the ground level it contains a a big area where vehicles have to drive in to collect equipment to then go out uh, into the Antarctic landscape to do science. And it also has a big vehicle workshop as well. So they've got um, bulldozers and things going backwards in and out, in and out all the time. So they wanted the building to be at ground level to make it easy to drive into. However, of course, that throws up a big problem because now when the wind blows towards the building, um, on the other side of the building, the wind blows over the top and then the snow just piles up against the leeward side. So to overcome that, the building has a what's called a wind deflector, which is essentially a piece of a, a big sail that sticks out from the building. So the wind blows over the roof and then the wind gets channeled between the deflector and, and the building that's here. So the deflector is here and the building is here and the wind gets channeled down and accelerated down the leeward facade so that you basically use the wind to clear the snow away on the other side. So it's a it's a kind of different device. I think it is it is, you know, the easiest thing is elevation. And um, yeah, at Scott Base, the, the building is elevated. So the every part of the building is a minimum of one to one and a half meters above the ground surface. So that the air just flows underneath. But the, in the building at Rothera, the British Antarctic Survey were particularly keen that the um, uh, they should have ground level so they could just drive in and out really easily. Whereas at Scott Base, we have to have quite big ramps to drive in and out because it yeah. is elevated above the ground. Yeah. So do you think that's like a sort of or, or almost uh, equally as good a solution or is it still best to place it on piles? Uh, I prefer the elevated solution um, because I think it's a, it's a very economic way of getting the wind to clear the snow for you. So I think that's a good that's that's good. And I think um, that in eventually, you know, these buildings have a limited life, you know, 25 to 50 years at most. And when it comes to remove them, it's easier to remove a building which is lifted up on legs than it is yeah. sitting on the ground. So potentially it's in the longer term, a more environmental sustainable solution. Yeah. But yeah, I think it slightly depends on the specific requirements. But yeah, um, I think in the, if you can, uh, we would always look at elevation first of all. Yeah, yeah. OK, uh, so um, that's interesting that you talk about removing these uh, buildings eventually, because um, the question is there, of course, whether you should even build on Antarctica, because it's so difficult. You have to design so many uh, specific things and use these special materials to make it as insulating as possible. Um, so are you designing these uh, buildings mostly with that? How, how do you keep that in mind uh, when what when the future of the buildings in Antarctica might be uh, rather um, yeah, uncertain. Sure. Um, well, I think you raise a number of kind of interesting points there, all in one question. So, so the first, the first one is about the whole question of, you know, whether we should be building buildings in Antarctica at all, because it's a very pristine environment. Um, you know, the most undisturbed environment on the planet, and um, every time we build something, we should be able to justify that decision many more times over than we would with any other kind of construction. And uh, of course, the only justification can be that the scientific research that is going to come 
as a consequence of this building is of such an important level and will have such an enormous benefit to us all that it justifies what what essentially is is the wrong thing to do sort of naturally if you think about it um, and I think um, you know that's 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 always the big challenge I mean it's obviously of no surprise I guess that the promoters of these buildings are always national governments they're never private organizations um, and these governments have formed a treaty organization between them through the Antarctic Treaty so that they have to justify in front of each other what scientific benefits will come from their station before the other nations kind of will agree to the principle of them building at all um, and it is quite an onerous process that you have to dem it it's not to do with aesthetics it's all to do with your impact on the environment you know the amount of fuel that you'll burn the amount of energy it will take to build it and then the consequential science that will come out of it um, and uh, I guess it's not entirely for me to judge that but you know what you hope for is that science of, of science of the caliber that came out of Halley to find the hole in the ozone layer is what is coming out of all of these stations. I think that's that's really important. Um, the question then becomes, you know, what technologies can we introduce to these Antarctic stations to minimize their environmental impact? And the first thing, of course, you can do is, are there any ways that you can do the science remotely that mean that people don't need to go there at all? Because that would be a good that would be a good thing to do. And I think that's a change that we will see more and more and more over the decades to come. More and more sophisticated remote monitoring taking place. And already in Antarctica, there is a lot of remote monitoring stations uh, measuring ice flows, measuring temperature, measuring interactions with the Earth's atmosphere and, and so on. And I think we'll see more and more of that. But inevitably, there are lots of kind of science that you do need people there. You need people to calibrate the experiments. You need people to count penguins. Uh, you need people to monitor the, the whale population, the seal population, all, all these kind of things. So there's there's going to be a long term need for people, people to visit and carry out these things. But I think every time somebody is it's decided that someone will go, there needs to be a good justification behind behind it. Um, and then and then. You know, the next the next challenge is if you are going to be there and you are going to build, well, then you should minimize your impact as much as possible. So you should burn as little fossil fuels as possible. None, if you can. Um, you should uh, utilize materials which make very airtight, well insulated buildings so that they need the least energy to heat them up. You should use systems which require the least amount of energy to melt ice or convert seawater to fresh water for your drinking water, cooking, washing, that kind of thing. You should come up with waste systems which need as little water as possible to make them to make them work. And wherever possible, you should use sustainable sources of energy, whether it's wind or solar, in uh, as opposed to using generators. But you have to make all these decisions, but at the same time, not put people's lives at risk. So if you rely on solar energy, uh, you're going to be in trouble in winter because there's no sun unless you've got a really good reliable battery storage system and that kind of thing doesn't exist yet but i think it is the kind of construction that relies on people constantly looking at what's the latest technology and how can it be applied to minimize the impact on the environment and and you know there's a i feel a great sense of responsibility every time we work on these projects to make sure that we push that uh, environmental sustainability side of the design yeah very interesting so it's not really about the aesthetics in antarctica as well uh well yeah well, well that's, of, a, like, that's, a, that's a difficult to... question to answer isn't it i mean i'm i'm an architect so obviously yeah. i get a little bit excited about the aesthetics and yeah. you know the, the good thing about designing buildings in antarctica is that you know as you observed earlier you know they're often elevated in the ground um, they have to respond to high wind speeds, so they often have quite, you know, curved corners, so that the wind blows round them. Um, they they have to have cladding solutions which keep the cold out. Um, they they have small little windows. Um, they often have photovoltaic panels to generate energy and uh, uh, wind turbines to help generate energy. So you've got quite a few ingredients already 
for making quite space age type architecture. Um, yeah. So in that in that respect, you're kind of lucky with the ingredients that you have to play with. Um, and then and then after that, you know, that you have to start, you know, there's uh, thinking about the construction process and how to make that as easy as possible and so on. Um, but of course, there are moments when, you know, um, you know, you are de you are designing a product and you're trying to make it as efficient, as ergonomic and as pleasant for people to occupy and uh, work next to inside as you can. So, yeah, there's there's always a, a place for architectural detailing, even in the exterior of the buildings. And then on the inside, of course, the architecture, the interior architecture matters a huge amount because people are living in these stations, you know, uh, uh, for maybe a year and a half. For long periods, they will be stuck inside because the weather is so bad they can't go outside. And they're away from their home and their family. So you need to make it as supportive as possible. And that ranges from the materials you use, you know, the spatial design. So you create places that people can be on their own, but also places that people can be as a community to support each other, places that people will bump into each other for a chat. Um, um, you have to use materials that, you know, remind them of home, but you also have to uh, make best advantage of the environment that they're in and of the natural light in summer um, and being able to close yourself off from the dark and the cold in, in winter. Um, yeah. And in that respect, it's a bit like, yes, yeah, it's, it's sort of like you find yourself thinking of the very first principles of architectural design. You know, what is it like when I swing my feet out of bed in the morning? Is the floor cold? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it warm? You know, all these kind of things. Do I have to queue up to go to the bathroom or do I have my own bathroom? You know, that you just start asking yourself loads and loads of questions, imagining yourself spending a day there and how can you make it as as pleasant, both as an individual, but as a member of a community yourself? Yeah, because uh, I also noticed something that in most of your designs, you place the, um, the uh, communal space in the center of the uh, uh, the, the design. So I imagine that's also why. Mm. Um, and you also, uh, which is also something that I really wanted to talk about, uh, like the way that you uh, keep in mind the uh, mental health of the um, the, uh, the people who will occupy these buildings. Because in uh, I read that in the Rotera, Rotera project, uh, you use some vibrant colors in a way that um, for the people uh, who have to be there during winter, Mm. And in Haley 6, you included daylight simu simulation in the yes. bathroom, I think? So, so when we when we um, when we were doing the, even the competition for the Halley project, um, we were thinking, oh, you know, we need a, we need a special angle to, you know, uh, to sort of support our proposal. And um, we had had a talk in our office by this woman called Angela Wright, and she was a color psychologist. So she looks into the impacts of colour on your day to day life. And uh, I mean, she will advise you on anything. She'll advise you on the colour of the clothes you wear, the colour of your bed linen. She'll she'll help you with any kind of colour you want. And it's fantastic. And um, so so we brought her into our project and she did give us a lot of advice on selecting colours for the inside of the building. And and she in, in fact invented a special complementary palette of colours that we've then used on um, some of the other projects, which is actually what we have used on Rothera. And she calls it the spring palette. And it's because obviously spring is full of bright and vibrant and optimistic colors. And in particular, it, that is good when combined with the right lighting to help people overcome this thing called seasonal affected disorder uh, or sad disease, which you can uh, suffer very badly uh, when it gets dark. So. Um, people in Northern Europe and particularly in Northern Scandinavia often suffer quite badly from uh, SAD because of the very long dark uh, winters. And, you know, simple measures like colour, uh, lighting, which simulates the change in light level through the day, sort of the biorhythmic nature of light and circadian rhythms of light, um, you know, all can have very positive benefits on your sort of balance of melatonin and serotonin just helping you to overcome the sort of winter blues. And then um, we just we just did again. It was, you know, that same same process of, you know, swing your bed out, your feet out of bed. What does the floor feel like? We just started to think about what are the what are the things that people miss when they're in Antarctica? You know, they may not they not, may not even always remember they miss them, but 
deep down they know they miss them. And it's, it can often be things like just the smell of wood or of flowers and things like that. So uh, when we were designing, you know, some of the spaces in Halley, the social spaces, we included these timber panels that were made of Lebanese cedar veneer because it's one of the woods that has the strongest smell, you know, like the smell of cedar. So that, you know, they, they may not even notice, but as they're going up this staircase, there's kind of like a nice smell. And in the Antarctica, there is no smell because there's no vegetation, no trees, no flowers, virtually no wildlife even at Halley. Um, and so these small things, colour, lighting systems, some smell, they, they make, they're amazing what a difference they can make. And then you overlay, you then, you know, have the next step of how you do your building arrangements and layout. And you start thinking about oh, spaces for people to be together and be noisy, places for people to be together and be quiet, places for people to be on their own and quiet, places for people to be just one or two people together. Just, you know, as you would like to live your daily life. Um, so we tried to replicate that within within the buildings. Yeah. So have you been to uh, Antarctica as well? Because you talk about these experiences that like the smells that you don't have. Did you experience mm. that as well? Or is it? Yeah, yeah. So I, I was lucky. I went to I went to Halley twice. I've been to um, Juan Carlos one time. Uh, I've been to Scott Base two times as well. And then in the process of all those visits, um, uh, because of the the difficulty of travel, uh, you end up visiting lots of other um, stations at the same time. Um, going to Halley and uh, going to Juan Carlos, we ended up travelling through quite a few other. Um, research facilities so you get to experience quite a few of them which is which has been really useful and um, you know they all have something special to offer they all have yeah. good things and bad things and uh, you know it's just it's really important to sort of like you know I mean I remember once spending the night in a in the Chilean base Eduardo Frey on uh, King George Island and you know, it's just the, the the position there of the dining room looking out over the bay is, is absolutely fantastic. And you just have to, uh, yeah, you, you, because you, I just you just realise you probably never go back to that place again. It's really important to be observant when you're there and go, oh, yeah, that's why I really like that. And I'll remember that. And I may not get the opportunity to use it again for a bit, but I will use it again. And then, you know, t uh, 15 years later or 10 years later, we're working on Scott Base. And the idea of placing the dining room up high and looking out towards Mount Erebus, you know, became a big sort of feature. And it actually was quite good because it played also to some of the teaching that we had from some of the Maori community who were also working with us on the design of Scott Base to orientate your building to the main key geographical features in your vicinity so that your, your building has a strong sense of place. So that's why the, there again, you know, this idea of the dining room facing towards Mount Erebus, which is the volcano on Ross Island, see, you know, also was uh, resonated strongly with the Maori principle of caring for your landscape and responding to it. But also, I guess, was a little bit sort of inspired by that experience of being in the Chilean building at the same time. Yeah. So it sounds like that you have uh, really done some uh, elaborate research on the on the uh architecture sort of in Antarctica, which is quite different than now uh, uh, the design of uh, Mr. Salmon that we talked about because he hadn't been to Antarctica. No, but it I sounds know, like yeah. it's actually quite important still for the architectural I think, design. I think there's, um, yeah, so, so, you know, that working in Antarctica throws up some significant uh, clim clim climatological, uh, environmental kind of challenges. You know, obviously the cold, the wind, how you construct the buildings, yeah, you know, all there are loads and loads of challenges. But at the end of the day, you are an architect being design asked to design a piece of architecture. And I have done it, but I think that it's the but it's not a good thing to design a building for a place that without experiencing it. I think it's really and and I I am sure Philippe would love to go to Antarctica and he and he had to design that building unbelievably quickly. And it's a fantastic piece of design, in my opinion. But I bet he wishes he could go to Antarctica at the same time, because you, you know, to live with that crew for a few days, to experience that cold, to to see the amazing skies, and to appreciate the significance of the big sort of geographical features in your context, and also to think about the history. You know, they're they're all important influences 
on the design yourself that you're that you're carrying out. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm I feel I know I have been very lucky to go on trips to all these sites, but uh, I think it is beneficial as well. Yeah. Do you think it also changed your view maybe on the the designs that you might make in the future on the the main lands here? Um, yeah. I I think yeah. I'm sure I'm sure it does. Um, I think that um, I, I definitely, you know, in many sort of different ways, not always expected, but um, I, it makes me it makes me question the energy that buildings require. It makes me think about, you know, how we use our resources when we're designing buildings. It makes me think about the efficiency of the construction process. Um, but I've all I've always been very keen on. Um, designing buildings specific to their kind of context and their environment. And I think in a way sort of almost the the Antarctic work reinforces that that principle. And I'm sure a lot of people would think, oh, you, you know, they're just a space station. They could be just anywhere, but um, they're not actually conceived like that. You know, uh, and I think the um, the New Zealand base in particular is, uh, you know, has been very, very carefully sort of conceived to respond to its specific environment from a from the perspective of climate but also in terms of you know its sort of cultural identity as well so that's the scott base yes yeah 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 could you elaborate a little bit on that how does it uh... yeah so um uh, it's every one of these projects comes with a different kind of a brief or program and it's really interesting the differences between them because they obviously emanate from different nations but the New Zealand brief was always very clear that they wanted a building with a strut which was characteristic of New Zealand and which embodied yeah, the spirit of the nation. And um, obviously, you know, in, in New Zealand, um, you know, they, they have worked extremely hard for a sort of integrated culture between the European settlers and the Maori community, the first settlers of New Zealand. And so they were very keen that they wanted this building to represent that integrated society within, within the country. So, uh, you know, we with the architects that we work with um, in Auckland, Jazmax, they have a strong cultural identity arm to their to their practice. So they helped us a lot. Um, and then they organized for us all to stay over a, a weekend um, in a Maori meeting hall called a, a, a Marae. Uh, in, a, in an event called a Hui, and we all stayed overnight in Christchurch in this place, and and uh, the whole conversation was about well-being and connecting, connected to land, connected to the land of Antarctica, but also to the land of New Zealand, and you know, ha, you know, what are the processes of entering someone's house, being received, being welcomed? So we 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 thought a lot about all those kind of principles. In, in laying out the building and and yeah, I good. yeah I think I think it does reflect that quite strongly yeah well this uh, really uh, this interview has become sort of a uh, a binding uh, podcast of all the other things that we talked about so far because we also talked about uh, this kind of thing how how a person should experience how much uh, an architect should think about the uh, co the what what the future occupier wants to experience in a building and um, with the psychological uh, uh, architectural psychology. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that's yeah. I think that's a really um, um, I mean, one of the things that we do find that we spend a lot of a lot of effort on in these Antarctic projects is is talking to the users of the building. And, yeah. and that's a, that's at a very functional level. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking to scientists. So, you know, you, you, you want to a lab for investigating, uh, you know, marine marine biology. So, you know, what do you need in there? Do you need, um, uh, you know, which, what kind of gases are you going to use? What kind of experiments are you going to do? So there's a very practical side to this, but also there's the kind of like practical side of, of living there and what, you know, what kind of environment people are looking for. And what, what you're not asking them to do is, you know, describe at the architecture, you're just asking them to describe the life they envisage for themselves in that place. You know, yeah. is it is it formal? Is it informal? Are there some formal places? Are there some informal places? You know, um, what do you do on a Saturday night to have fun? 
you know, it's all it's all those kind of things. And and yeah. then you try and build the building around around that. Yeah, that's interesting. It's really Do important we, uh... as well to write all these things down early mm-hmm. on and to to constantly revisit them. And when when people are telling you, oh, I can't build that or oh, that's way too expensive. Yes, sure. You have to make changes to the design. But at the same time, you have to say, yeah, but hold on a minute. We're we're building this building for 50 years of life. In 40 years time, the people will be sitting there. Do we want them to be happy sitting together as a community or do we want them to be remembering that we saved 10 euros on the light fitting? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we want them, to, we, you know, so it's just like yeah. that kind of um, remember the objectives. I think it's a really, I, that's something I actually take from these projects and I try and take to other projects as well is remember why you're doing it because you know, saving one euro now might cost you 10 over its life. So uh, let's let's do it properly. Yeah. So do you think you might be working on the uh, Antarctica projects for a long time in your future still, even after the Rotterdam project is finished or the? the yes. Yes, uh, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, we, really we, we, we have. Um, yeah, the New Zealand project will go on for some time. There are more projects that Bass are planning. Um, we've been talking to the Australians uh, about some projects as well. So, yeah, uh, hopefully. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. OK, uh, I think while well, we have uh, arrived at the final question, um, it's a, a question that we ask all of our uh, our guests uh, to the podcast. Um, so the question is, what do you think is the most important thing the students of today should know about these topics that we just talked about? And are there any topics that you think we should gain uh, more knowledge, knowledge about? Um, well, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, the, the, I guess that question has many, many kind of strands to it, doesn't it? And yeah. and and right right now, you know, we all know that the biggest challenge is to do with the environment. Um, so, you know, there are there are good lessons to be learnt from these projects about environmental sensitivity. There's there's the bad side that we talked about, you know, why are you building in such a pristine place and why are you using all that energy on a ship to take it all there? But then once it's there, um, you know, these buildings can teach us a lot because they utilize the wind to um, keep them clear from snow. They're very well insulated. They're very well sealed. They use much less water per person than we use in a temperate environment. Um, They utilize renewable energy in, in far greater degrees than than we do um, in temperate environments. So I think there are good sustainable lessons that come from these constructions. I guess for me, for me personally, some of the things that I've learned and that I think are beneficial for anybody in design is is I just do loads of talking to people and, uh, you know, just asking people questions, you know, just, um, you know, how how do you live? How do you what, what when you go to have breakfast? What do you is it quick? Does it take 10 minutes? Do you like to sit and make two coffees and it takes 30 minutes? Um, you know, in the evening, do you like to go to your room or do you want to watch TV? Or sometimes is it a bit of both? And why do you never watch the TV? Is it not that comfortable in there? You know, and I just think asking lots and lots of questions to try and come up with a so that, you know, when you're developing the design, you know, you can say, oh, I've developed this movie room because everybody told me that it was so uncomfy watching TV in the dining room. They wanted a comfier space to be able to watch TV. And, and you know, it's just, you know, designing buildings around the way people use them and find out the way they use them. Don't imagine you know the answer. I think that's that's kind of a, a big lesson I've learned out of this process. Yeah. Um, there's probably a good way of going about designing any kind of building because then, then you, you then also design efficient buildings because you design buildings that people want to use because they're designed around their their requirements and you don't end up with lots of wasted space. You don't end up with rooms that people never go into. Um, And yeah, which that's that's also a kind of approach to sustainability. Sustainability isn't all about cladding and wind farms. It's also about efficiency and uh, ergonomics and people's well-being. And therefore, that makes sure that we don't build more than we need. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. well, thank you. Do you have any questions still? Um, 
Yeah, well, in the beginning, I was wondering a bit because you said you were quite a small firm. And then, um, yeah, this is more of like a technical question. But I was always thinking like normally you only have like very big firms that do like uh, do those competitions. Because at first I always thought it was like also like financial st stability kind of because, yeah. So how do you like, because you could spend quite a lot of time on just doing that project. So how can you, yeah, I don't know. Is, is it like, for me, it just doesn't seem kind of logical as a small firm to like be able to do a competition because you don't know if you're like ah, going to get but this, paid. This, yeah, we were so lucky because yeah. um, when we did when we did the competition for the British Antarctic Survey, mm -hmm. there were there were three stages to it. Mm -hmm. So in the first stage, you you had to do uh, like uh, fifteen A four pages maximum to tell them about your company. Don't forget, we were doing it with a big firm of engineers, so we, they had to tell about their company as well. And then about your how you would go about designing the project. So so we just drew it by sketches. by We drew it, the whole thing by hand. We did all the writing by hand, all the drawings by hand, coloured it in Photoshop, but there were no typing or and CAD or anything. And um, they, they liked that because um, it was sort of very accessible and they but there was not a fixed answer. So then we got shortlisted for the second stage and the second stage was only six weeks long. And so we did spend a lot of money doing CGI's and things like that, but it was only six weeks long. And, and, then, and then they shortlisted so, so down to the final three firms. And then each of the three, uh, well, not firms, but three groups of companies. So we were with a big firm of engineers and us, each of them got paid to do the oh. final stage of the competition and quite a lot. At, so at the time, doing the competition was our biggest project in our office because everything else was just like, you know, people's apartments and things like that. So uh, the competition, whether we won or lost, was our biggest job. Um, OK, so yeah, that's, really that, that's cool. why that's why it was kind of lucky. But I think, um, you know, if they were to do the same competition again and not pay you, but you had six months. I agree. Then that would prejudice against small firms taking part, and then they wouldn't have got the um, the result that they were after. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about it. Like, how were you, like, financially able to do it? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we had every everybody in the office. Well, there were only I think we were one, two, three, four, five five of us at that point, and mm -hmm. we all just worked on that competition. So that was quite unusual as well. I I would be. It would, I wouldn't be able to do that now for so long, but um, yeah. But yeah. it was when when we won, it was lucky when it came to a close when it did, because the other two companies were very big and very successful companies, and they started to realise, oh my God, we might not win this. So they just brought so many people to work on the project, and they did so many amazing CGI's and fly throughs. And it was lucky that there was a deadline because if it had gone on for another three weeks, you know, we couldn't have afforded to do any more CGI's, but they could have just flooded it with amazing things. And they might have they might have just won because of presentation rather than ideas. But uh, fortunately, it stopped at just the right minute. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. Yeah, okay. cool. OK, yeah, it was really Thanks. nice listening to it. Broughton for recording this podcast with us. And to the audience, thank you for listening. This was the last podcast of our Symposium Week. Tomorrow, December 11th, 2020, a final Symposium livestream will be held. Our guests will be Marco Vermeulen and Renier from Unsense. You can find more information about attending the live stream on the GEOPS website, Instagram and Facebook, in our Spotify and SoundCloud bio, and in the description below if you're listening from YouTube. All of our podcasts are available on our channel on Spotify, YouTube and SoundCloud.